In our view, the backdrop really on all of this stuff can be explained with uh, the innovation spectrum. So, Clayton Christensen in the Innovator's Dilemma, this is really key, especially for enterprise folks, coined the term sustaining technology and disruptive technology. We talk about sustaining innovation and disruptive innovation because innovation doesn't happen just with technology. Big businesses live over here on the sustaining side, they do sustaining side very well. It's not a pejorative. All of you that are in startups wish you had the problems that sustaining innovators have. Why? Because they're already selling billions of dollars worth of products to a huge market. Or even tens of millions of dollars to a decent sized market. They're over on the sustaining side. The company is optimized for executing in a known market. They understand the problems, they understand their customers, they understand the solutions that work, the business practices generally work pretty well over on the sustaining side. They can benefit from lean startup too because they want to move quicker. They want to run more experiments. They can benefit from that. They can understand their customers in new ways. But generally, sustaining innovators got to be big successful companies because they understand it. They understand that stuff. That's how they got them. Disruptive innovation is completely up. Unknown market, problem not well understood, solutions not understood. Startups like to pretend they're over here on the disruptive side. Most startups really aren't over on the end point. They're sort of somewhere in between. Some terms that uh, Steve Blank uses are like resegmented low cost or resegmented niche markets. So they're looking at existing markets and they're carving it up in a little bit of a different way and adding more value to, to the customers that live in that, in that niche. And actually, doing startups over on the sustaining side is fairly popular because you actually can become an acquisition target. So a lot of large companies are actually looking at startups to help them even solve some things on the sustaining innovative side. So I don't really care. Again, to me, that's all of the, the media and the venture capitalists that whine that startups aren't being innovative enough are not ones that are getting you know, acquired for 10 or 20 or 50 million dollars, which is a life-changing experience, and then you get to take some of your money and reinvest it into the ecosystem. To me, that's all good. That's actually what's gonna make the new economy hum. So if you're doing something on the sustaining side, I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you you're doing the wrong thing. Go for it. Maybe your second one will be more, more disruptive. But so the, the example that Clayton Christensen uses in the Innovator's Dilemma to sort of explain these concepts, he looks at all this data from the 90s Tons of data on hard drives. So back then, in the 90s, you had five and, a inch, five and a quarter inch hard drives. Pretty darn monster hard drives that held only 10 megabytes of data. It's pretty crazy to think back then, right? 10 megabytes of data, and they sold thousands of these things to large companies that were implementing their servers and their, uh, their workstations and all these things. So if you run the business unit that's in charge of hard drives, you know, you talk to the scientists or some of your technologists and they say, listen, I think that we can double the capacity in these hard drives. We've got this new technology and I think we can put it in that same form factor and we can double, double the capacity. And the business unit guy's going, all right, well, so what's going to be my return on investment? And the guy's all like, well, I went out and talked to this IT manager. We sold 10,000 units to him last year. He's running out of space. I think it's very possible we can sell another 10,000 units to him. So I'm going to be able to make, you know, $350,000 from this customer, or even more, $3.5 million from this customer. Business unit guys going, oh, that seems like a pretty good deal. I think my bosses will like that. I'm taking my budget, and I'm going to, like, increase all of our revenue. So he actually can write out a business case. There's a product manager over at a new startup who's got a three-and-a-half-inch drive. And it holds 20 megabytes of data. And he brings it out to that same IT guy. <laughs> Look at that clunky old five and a quarter inch drive. Lame. Look at that, that's such old technology. I can fit that same capacity in this three and a half inch drive. Isn't that cool? You want to buy some? And the IT manager goes like, why? Is a paperweight? Is that like a souvenir? It's got your little name stamped on it? You gonna give that away as a tchotchke at the trade show? I'll never buy that. It doesn't fit in any of my systems. That's ridiculous. Why did you waste all your money building that? I will never buy that three and a half inch drive. Never. A year later, a 
Literally, goes by two years. Now that same IT manager is supporting a thousand laptops in the field, and he's buying thousands of those hard drives. A thousand of those three and a half inch drives. He didn't know. He couldn't predict it. Neither could the startup. I had no idea where we were going to sell that many, or that it was going to take two or three years. The point really is, is that the business practices that you use on the sustaining side are not the same as the practices that you use on the disruptive side. So if you're a startup, you can't just go out and ask your customer, because they don't know the answer. You can't ask them if they like your cool widget project. You can't ask them how much money they would pay. You can ask them, and they'll tell you. You can't believe what they say, because they don't understand. They don't have any content. Which is why startups have to go find their early adopters, because early adopters are those few people that are like you, that understand the problem that you're trying to solve. So now you can start having a conversation. The moment you find your early adopter, you start a, sort of stepped off the disruptive endpoint, and you're starting the progress down towards the sustaining side, which is what you want to do, because that's where the market is, and that's where the margin is. So the big problem is, to the big companies, is that they're optimized for this. They can't do that anymore. This is the innovator's dilemma. Right? So you're that business unit manager, and you actually have somebody on staff who's really wacky, and they're like, oh yeah, I invented this really crazy stuff where I can put all this 20 megabytes inside of a three and a half inch drive. And the business unit manager is going like, who told you to go do that? You, know, you should be assigned to this five and a quarter, five inch and a quarter drive team. Go, go back to your job, right? Because this is where my revenues are. I'm going to only invest in that. I'm not going to invest in this other thing it's because I don't understand the ROI, right? So that gets us to uh, time of this presentation. The two questions that kill disruptive innovation inside of a large organization. <clears throat> Pretty much already told you. What's my return on investment and when am I going to see it? It takes most startups five to seven years to get to serious traction. I hope you guys who have started companies understand that. You're just at the beginning of a long slot. But most, most enterprises, if you tell them it's going to take five years for them to get return on their investment, they're just like, there's no way. But of course, the concern is, wow. The concern is, is that the market's going to go away. There's transformation that's happening that makes the market go away. Or there's a startup that's going to come and steal it. So the real dilemma is, how do you convince the, these managers that they need to invest some of their money into these crazy experiments so that hopefully they can get some big wins that are inside the organization? So how do you get that sort of transformation from your bosses? If they don't already get it, I just buy an Eric Reese's book. That's like, and maybe that works. And if that works, then you can call me and I'll try to train them how to do it. Um, the other thing is, though, if you're an innovator, if you're an entrepreneur inside of a large organization, go find out, go find the other people that are like you. They actually already exist. They really do. And do as a project, run a meetup that's inside your organization where you bring together the people that are acting entrepreneurial or that want to act entrepreneurial. It's the same sort of thing as creating a, a startup ecosystem, but you're creating it inside your organization. And then do a hackathon. I'm serious. Just do a startup weekend inside your own company, inviting the people that are entrepreneurial into your organization. And what you'll get, if you do that a few times, is you'll get these, these cool ideas, and then if you, if you sort of Incubate on your own these cool little ideas to the point that you can actually start showing some traction, maybe some savings, maybe some customer engagement. Now there's some risk involved, right? If the wrong people figure out that you're doing this, you might be affecting the brand, it might be illegal things. So there is a little bit of risk there. Uh, and, we, and we actually help companies mitigate those risks, but the leading organizations, I think, start by, there's design thinkers that are already inside the organization that are doing some of this stuff, where there's agile programmers inside the organization, and they're already doing kind of this stuff. And you start bringing these people together, and you can start generating a little bit of momentum inside of this large enterprise. 